see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and I'd like to invite you to this panel, which is panel number 2A, uh, for our year-long conference on how to build a culture of empathy and compassion. And in this, this panel is on how does the No Fault Games Zone teach and support creating a culture of empathy in schools? And I'd like to uh, turn it right over to Jared Finkelstein, who is our moderator for this panel. Hi, Jared, and thank you for uh, moderating this panel. Thanks. Thanks for having us. This, is, uh, this feels sort of historic in a, in a sweet, sweet sort of way to have a chance to talk about activating empathy in schools, in particular to explore this, uh, this wonderful game, the No Fault Zone game. Um, I suppose first I'd like to introduce everyone on the panel so that anyone who may be watching this is familiar with who we are. I'd love to, to say a little bit about you, but if you want to chime in and add something, I'd love that as well. Um, first and foremost, we have uh, Sura Hart and Victoria Kindle Hobson, who are the inventors of the No Fault Zone game. Um, do either of you want to wave so we know who is who? That's Sura. Hi. <laughs> Victoria, hi. Glad you're both here. Um, is there anything you wanted to say by way of just introducing yourselves? Hmm, not right now. All right. Stay okay. tuned. All right, and then we also have with us uh, Tom Gostinger. Am I saying that correctly, Tom Gostinger? Yes, you are. Hi, welcome. Um, hi. Tom is, uh, is an administrator, assistant administrator at a middle school, the high, the high school at a middle school, high school at called uh, called the Landmark Academy. Do I have that right? Yes, that's correct. And yeah. it's a K through twelve charter school with about a thousand students in Port Huron, Michigan. Right. right. And uh, for the last few years, you've been uh, a leader in an all school changing initiative to sort of introduce more social emotional cooperative learning into the curriculum, and the No Fault Zone game has been a part of that. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I also taught uh, fifth grade for several years and yeah, I used the game there as well. Fabulous, fabulous. I'm looking forward to hearing how you brought the game into the curriculum. Okay. And then the last person on our panel is Sophie Longry. Do I have your last name correct? That's great. <laughs> that works? Okay. And I have it here that you were the winner in 2011 of the Quebec YMCA Peace Prize. Uh, 2010. 2010. Yes. Great. Uh, and that was based on your work of introducing the No Fault Zone game into the classroom, is that right? That's right. That's that's what it was. <laughs> and uh, I also understand that when you started out, you were a volunteer in the classroom, and you were bringing the game into the classroom, and they enjoyed your contribution so much they brought you on full-time? Well, absolutely. We started with two classes, and a year later, I had the whole school, so I guess it worked really well. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Fabulous. Well, I, like again, I, similarly, I'm really eager to get to the meat of this panel and hear a lot about what that experience has been like for you. So uh, those are, that, that's who on, is on our panel. I'm, I'm Jared Fickelstein. I'm a, a collaborative trainer at uh, Bay Area Nonviolent Communication in Oakland, California, and a certification candidate with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. And I have a, a lot of passion about activating empathy in schools and bringing the, the skills and tools of, of nonviolent communication into classroom curriculum. So it's a real honor for me to moderate this conversation because it's exactly what I love to talk about and think about with people who are doing exactly what I want to do in the world. So I'm very, very excited about this. Um, I think where I'd like to begin today is just to turn over to, to the inventors of this game, to you, Sura, and to you, Victoria. And um, I'd love to hear a little history of how, how you came to develop the, the No Fault Zone game and, and maybe a little bit about what the game is and just begin our, our conversation there. So are, are you willing to start? Sure. I'd be happy to start. I'm really excited to hear from Tom and Sophie, but I would like to give a little background of the game. We designed the game to support empathic connection. and. Uh, I'd like to just say my understanding of empathy, which is what uh, Edwin is all about, is creating a culture of empathy. My understanding of empathy is, in the words of Marshall Rosenberg, a respectful understanding of what another person is experiencing. 
specifically what feelings are up for them and what uh, values or needs are, are really alive for them. So to facilitate that kind of an empathic connection with someone else and also with ourselves uh, for self-empathy and self-connection. And that's at the, at the core of, of why we developed this game. Um, we wanted to make uh, in these materials that um, I guess we'll show at some point, uh, we wanted to make visible um, our inner space and the choices that we have at every moment to uh, take our thoughts and actions in the direction that would lead to either disconnection with ourselves and others or other choices we can make to uh, that would lead to more connection uh, with ourselves and with other people. So we wanted to make that inner space that sometimes we get very lost in very visible and concrete for young people and um, and for adults as well. Mm. And uh, and through that, um, uh, coming to a place of empathic connection, then people can use the game to sort out problems together, uh, work collaboratively to work through conflicts, and have have meaningful conversations. So. Um, yeah, so that's what we set out to do when we developed this game, and, and just a little bit of history because um, it really is about 25 or 30 years in the making of it. Um, Victoria and I met 25 years ago as classroom teachers in a school in Ojai, California, and in this school, uh, we really prioritized relationships and prioritized um, a compassionate community among students, teachers, and parents. Um, we were standing together on very solid ground of our interdependence and recognizing that uh, we are the world and um, we must be the change we want to see. So that was the ethos of, of the school and what drew Victoria and me there and how we met up there. And so we were always um, looking for how to support and nurture empathy and compassion in our school community and in our classrooms. And then, and I think it was 1998 when we met Marshall Rosenberg and his uh, nonviolent communication process, we both recognized it as the most practical and powerful tool to nurture uh, this compassion and empathy that we were wanting to nurture in ourselves and, uh, and young people. So from there, we um, just uh, really e explored how to integrate nonviolent communication <coughs> in the classroom life and, um, and worked with teachers and parents like ourselves for many years. And, and we really recognized, we came to recognize that we were part of a paradigm shift, a really deep cultural shift in our teaching practices and parenting practices. And the shift um, simply described as I see it is the shift from thinking we have to manage children's behavior, trying to manage children's behavior through um, a system of rewards and punishment, to meeting young people with empathy, really getting them right where they are. and through the connection there with them to then explore, um, you know, what, what might be the most satisfying ways to address our needs together. So that paradigm shift seems to be underway in the world and, and we're really excited about um, the ways in which uh, we see the game contributing to that. So, yeah, so just briefly um, from that point on we wrote a book, uh, The Compassionate Classroom, that integrated a lot of the practices we were using and, and the challenges that we were seeing with classroom teachers wanting to make that shift from rewards and punishment to empathic connection. Mm -hmm. And then we wrote a, a book for parents, respectful parents, respectful kids. And then a book um, that was a uh, conflict resolution curriculum called The No Fault Classroom. And it was uh, through that curriculum that we developed these materials that we call the No Fault Zone Game. Mm -hmm. And um, just a couple more things I want to say about that and then turn it over to Victoria. We, Victoria and I had, had um, done a lot of workshops and trainings with teachers and parents, um, taking the tools of nonviolent communication, the practices, and we were seeing what a long time it actually takes us adults to 
make that shift, that paradigm shift, and to um, learn this practice. So we charged ourselves with this curriculum to do it quicker. <laughs> And we thought by actually making tools that we could put into young people's hands, they could more quickly access the power of nonviolent communication and get to inner clarity and clarity with others. Um, and adults could be learning alongside with them. So teachers didn't need to go through extensive training. They didn't need to be experts in this social emotional intelligence that they could be learning alongside the kids. and. Um, yeah. So, and and just greatly reduce the time it would take to um, to really make that shift happen. So I think that's enough background, probably. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I'm, I'm getting it. I'm really getting a sense of of that this is a tool. Um, the no fault zone game is a tool. It's really designed to to support and activate sort of this innate empathic capacity human beings have. And that you and Victoria are really, it sounds like you've been on a journey together um, to, from the, you know, born at the ethos of the school that you were working at in Ojai, um, to, to really find ways of supporting a cultural shift from, from rewards and punishment structures of, of parenting and teaching to, um, to really encouraging models of empathic connection to help young people foster a stronger capacity in that, in that regard. Sounds like um sounds great. I'm I'm curious, Victoria, if you have anything you would like to to add that Sarah might have left out or that you're <laughs> passionate and excited about including. Well, yeah. What what I'm passionate and excited about, in addition to what Sarah shared, is that I am very much a, a visual picture and tactile kinesthetic learner. I, I do a lot of learning style work as well as this work. And when I was learning nonviolent communication, it was taxing my auditory listening skills <laughs> and my um, verbal skills, which are my weak suits. Mm. And so from the very beginning, studying with Marshall, I was on um, shaky ground. Mm. felt very uncomfortable for me. So from early days, I was, Sarah was, uh, we had a, somewhat agreed upon this. We were giraffe buddies trying to learn this together. And um, over, well, periodically we'd say, if there's only something we could touch or do with this, that was my desire. So when this came about and, you know, it's, this is the game board, I've got a reflection on it with the game board, and then we get the card decks, you know, we've got the, the feelings card decks, and then we've got the needs card decks, these are the print ones, and then we've got choices. This is my milieu, you know, touch it, feel it, put it down, look at it, move mm -hmm. them around. And then we've got the, the picture card decks for the, the kids with the um, little faces, feelings, faces, uh, and then the needs, different needs, all illustrated. This is where I started to really uh, get excited about possibilities for other learners like me uh, who are just you know, auditory listening is not me. And trying to remember what people said, their feelings were, I'm just, ah! <laughs> but when I can see the cards on the, the mat, then I'm right in the game. And I'm not anxious about whether I'm uh, remembering correctly. So mm -hmm. this just changed the whole thing for me. So I'm very excited about that. And then having shared the the game now in many schools. Tom is here because I've been working with the school in Michigan for, what is it, Tom? We've been together six I, years I, or something. Yeah, yeah, I think it's around six years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, so the last three, it's really taken off, but uh, we have a long history together. So it's fabulous seeing the response people have. It can be the youngest children, the kindergartners, you know, taking this on 
uh, or um, well, we've got it going in administration at at Tom School Landmark. Everybody oh. interacting from that, and they can all use the card decks and the mats. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty pretty exciting for me. Mm. Uh, I'm getting that that um. You know, that for you personally, the development of this game was sort of a journey of supporting your own integration and learning of, of Marshall Rosenberg's work of nonviolent communication and recognizing yourself as a, as a tactile learner, really having the visual and having the, the, the cards in hand supported, supported your integration. And then as a result of that, I've found so, sort of a whole other mechanism for how to introduce this to people as young as three, four, five years old. And then obviously it's being worked with, used it on the administrative level as well at Tom's school. Yes, yes, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm laughing a little bit right now because you've frozen on my screen, so you have this very, uh, very serious look on your face right oh, now. Oh, I do. Okay, actually, I have a smile now. <laughs> Everything's okay here, so. <laughs> okay, good. Well, um, um, do you have anything else you want to add, Victor? I'm, I'm very curious to hear from from Tom and Sophie about how they've how they've integrated the game in their schools. But I want to I want to give you a chance if there's any other piece you'd like to add about its development. Well, um, I think more may come out later in, in small snatches. I'd like to get to Tom and Sophie also. <laughs> sure. All right. So let's turn it over to you, uh, Sophie. How about you go first, and then Tom afterwards? Is that all right? Okay. <laughs> If Tom right. doesn't mind. No, uh, not at all. <laughs> so, well, I'd uh, love just to hear a story of, of, how, of how, uh, how you use the No Fault Zone game in the school that you work at. So where we left it, uh, Sophie, you were about to share with us a little bit about your experience using the No Fault Zone game in uh, your school in Quebec. Yes, absolutely. So when I realized that my children were having uh, some conflicts that were quite tough to resolve at school, I wanted to do something about it and help the community because I, I realized the teachers were not really well equipped for that. And I came upon NVC and thought, this is amazing. And that was an <laughs> just a revelation. But then bringing it back to school was kind of a disappointment because I realized that you need so much training and effort and you can't just ask from everybody to just become a giraffe all of a sudden. Not that we're not giraffes <laughs> originally, but it takes a while. And I was really looking for something that would make things easier and, to, you know, that would help bring NVC in school. And I, I, I uh, discovered the NoFault classroom and then the NoFault zone game. And that was a revelation because it made things so much easier. So I used a curriculum at school. And as I was proceeding with the curriculum, I realized exactly what was supposed to happen. The teachers were co-learning. The, the, the children were helping the teachers. Uh, I was also improving my skills in NVC. And it was just, uh, just fantastic. It worked so well. In the first year, we had a pilot project with two classes, two grade four and a grade two jumped on board on that year and the year after the, the headmistress asked me if I wanted to do the program from grade one to six and this year on year three we have kindergartners until grade six so we have basically the whole school in the program so it, it was just uh, really amazing so so can you give me just a, a little taste of what what does a program look like what are students engaged in doing in in the program and what sort of effect do you see that having in the classroom as far as fostering uh, empathic connection or conflict resolution or self-empathy? Mm. So the program is a series of workshop uh, that uses the, the No Fault Zone game. So we, we have a basic workshop on, on certain um, topics, like for example, uh, today we're going to talk about feelings and needs. And then how do we, after talking about feelings and needs, we can, have a, we can play with our cards and put them on the mat. And then we use real life situations to practice. So for example, on, we could be working in a workshop on uh, something that I don't really like that happened to me, a situation that I found difficult. And then you get the mat out and you just go, okay, how am I feeling? And put your cards down. What are my needs in this situation? So it's, it's really fun to use. It's easy, the children love it. And it's, it's also very, um, well, as Victor was saying before, it, it's, it makes it like a game. So you don't really feel, you feel involved, but at the same time, it's easy to do. Whereas if I ask you how you're feeling and what are you needing right now, it's a different thing. I, I, you know, it's, it's a bit more difficult for some people. 
So the children really enjoy the game. It's, it, it's, it's visual. They remember the steps well. Mm -hmm. And it, they really uh, build a literacy of feelings and need in a remarkable time. So, and so, uh, teachers too. So it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds like similar to what Victoria was saying before, that the, the use of the tactile and the visual really helps integrate uh, a literacy of, of feelings and needs, of a language for what we mean by feelings and needs. Um, yes. Do you see? Do you see? You know, I guess, I guess one of the things that I've encountered in my experience with NVC is sort of a, a gap between the language itself and sort of the spirit, the intention of connection, of being curious about one another. I'm just, I'd love to hear a little bit of, of what your experience has been like as children learn the literacy of these words. Um, how does that affect their interaction? How does that uh, affect uh, empathy in the classroom? Well, the, the the game is built so that you can use it two by two or, or you could use it as a whole group actually for conflict resolution. And, and this is very powerful because first we, we learn to play with the game on a personal basis with my own situations and then we bring it on, on, a, on a real conflict situation. So two children will have a, you know, say an argument during recess We'll come back in class and the teacher will say, well, why don't you both do uh, your iOS, which is the internal operating system, put your cards down and then swap places. I mean, that's, that's pretty much <laughs> direct em empathy for self and others right there. Mm. So you can see how one is feeling and needing, what, what's my friend feeling and needing right there? Mm. In this, you know, in this conflict, we also use it for uh, during uh, history classes, which is great fun. So we find historical characters that had fights or war, and we ask the kids to play uh, characters like historical people and then resolve conflict differently. What if you had the iOS? What could you do, and how could we resolve this fight? So it, it's really been great fun and such an easy way to acquire, you know, a language of feelings and needs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, great. Empathy, which is basically a, a language of empathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so something about having this language, just ha having access to this language sort of naturally leads to a curiosity and connection between what is the common humanity between, between people. Exactly. And, and it sounds like also the experience of, of switching spots on the mat, of, of sort of putting out your own feelings and needs and then having someone quite literally step into your shoes by looking at, at the map that you put down invites sort of the awareness of what's what we sometimes call the live in that person. Yes, and it's a, it's a really nice first step and after it becomes, you know, as you use it, it becomes more and more integrated and you maybe don't need the mat all the time, but yeah. then it becomes something that is part of you. So I have a teacher last week who said, and this is the fourth grade teacher who started the project with me, so three years ago, and he said, I was in, in the schoolyard the other day, and the fourth graders wanted to play with the sixth graders, and there was a fight, and the sixth graders didn't want them to play with them, and so the teacher came by and said, look, you know, what's going on here? And, and then the sixth grader says, well, look, we're so busy. We, there's so many people in our group. We don't want to have the fourth graders to play with us. And, and then the sixth grader went, hang on. I think we're excluding them. Mm -hmm. And I think they might need inclusion. And then the fourth grader, yes, absolutely. We also want to play and we need inclusion. <laughs> so, okay, why don't you line up and then play with us and wait for your turn? So I, this was just outside during recess, which is, so that means that this, this is really working and it's paying off. Yeah, so sort of sensing that, that the anguish that the other students were feeling might come from some sort of common human experience of wanting to be included mm -hmm. and being able to have language for that and, and even a awareness that that might be going on in someone else is yes. really supported and activated by the use of the, of the no-fall zone game in, in classrooms. Yes, exactly, because the steps are so easy with the game and now it's integrated and then we can use it in real life. And the oh. teacher was really impressed because he said a few years back, this would have finished by, you're stupid and your game isn't good. <laughs> and you said, I have these kids who can talk about inclusion right there. Yeah. So that was brilliant. Oh, wow, that's rich. <laughs> really rich and, and pretty inspiring, too, because um, I, I think it's too often. I mean, in my experience, too, on, on playgrounds, it ends with the, that kind of name calling or that sort of, um, you know, labeling of, of the, what the other people are, who the other people are, rather than trying to imagine what they're wanting and looking for solutions that could include everybody. Exactly. Mm. Um, I'm I'm curious to to turn over to you, Tom. Now I'm I'm wanting to hear a little bit about I mean similar questions. I wanted to hear 
what is what this journey has been like uh, introducing this game into as a tool into your school. Um, what are what some of the impacts you've you've uh, witnessed and seen over time as as young people have integrated it, and also I'm particularly curious to hear you've been working with older people, with administrators, with the game, and, and how that's affected the culture of the school. Right. right. Yeah. Um, I guess we could start out with a little uh, with a little picture of my school. If you were right. to uh, to walk down the halls of the school, uh, you may see the uh, the feelings needs mat and and cards out with uh, with students in the halls I and mean, we see, I just see this all the time just walking down the halls um, as in the classroom there are times it could be on it could be out at recess but also in, in the classroom there are times when we're just the kids are having some trouble with each other or whatnot and so they they break out the the cards and the mats and they're very comfortable with it in fact um, uh, much like Sophie was saying, as as how this is a progression starts out as something that's it's a really simple, easy tool to use, um, and so and so it's very uh, very quick that the students get uh, get the hang of it and understand how to be able to use that with each other. So uh, when I when I taught fifth grade, um, I would have students come up to me and say, "Mr. Gostinger, uh, so we were having I was having some difficulty with my." with my buddy over here, um, wondering if I could take the feelings and needs mat and we could go talk about it out in the hall. And, uh, and to me, that speaks of what, um, well, it speaks of how, how well this works because mm. our uh, education, the, uh, education in a whole is, uh, um, it's run by communication. So I, I think of communication as the heartbeat of education and, uh, and how do we get, how do we get our own heartbeats to be stronger, well, we exercise. So, how do we exercise communication um, in the school? Well, this is one way because many times, many times the kids have a limited vocabulary with how they're feeling. I'm mm. just so mad, you know, or they, or they can't even express that, and so they just act out in some way. Um, and so, so the tool really helps to bring it back, to take a step back, so that they can kind of focus on, um, okay, yeah, this is how I'm feeling. And yet, and although that's really valuable, and that's and that's important to me, and it's important in this situation, also the feelings stem from some need that I um, that for some reason I'm not that is not being met for me, or is not being met in our group. Uh, so it's so I've found that um, I, I see that all over our school a lot as far as um, moving over to the middle school, high school, and now we've got the the, you know, students that are getting older and and um, uh, they're dealing with all of the the hormones and all of that kind of thing too. So I see I see a lot of difficulty sometimes with them being able to relate to each other. Um, mm. But for the high school for the high schoolers, sometimes they don't want to use the feelings and and needs met. They just kind of want to say whatever it is. Um, but what I've found is directing them back to that brings the situation down a lot quicker as far as their, their feelings being so escalated. It helps them to focus on something other than the person that they're frustrated with at the time. Mm. It's, uh, the tool almost is a paradigm shift for them because they, um, I, had two, I had a girl come in the other day to my office and she, um, she had just had an altercation, like a verbal altercation with another girl at, at, the lunch, at lunchtime. And uh, so, she, so she's meeting with, with me in my office, and I, um, I said, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, why have things been so difficult for you? And she said, well, and she kind of went into the story. And so she goes, well, I just, and I just kind of blew up at her. And, I, and, and, and we were yelling back and forth, and um, Mr. Gastinger, can I just, can I, um, can I talk with her? And, and I thought, well, I mean, because we're, we were right off that little battle. <laughs> so I said, I said to her, well, I'm not sure now's the best time to talk with her because I think both of you are still heated. And she goes, yeah, I know, um, but we had worked together before. Yeah, I know I, was, I am still heated, but I really think that we could, we could now we can come to some kind of common ground and maybe we can get past this. I said, okay, well, I'm willing to do that. 
uh, and I'm inside I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is amazing that she has <laughs> resolve this <laughs> with the other student. And so um, I, but I, I said, okay, so um, I'm going to allow you to do that. I've got two conditions. Um, one condition is we're going to use the, the feelings and needs um, game board and, and, and cards. I said, because that's going to help you to focus and get your, get your feelings and needs out on this. And you can take your focus off of that other person and kind of put them into this. And then, and then my, my second need at the time was, um, or condition at the time, I said, um, I want to make sure it doesn't escalate in here. I don't want yelling in my office. <laughs> so we can go ahead and we can have the conversation and, and let's just, let's, let's work on resolving the issue. So she said, yeah, I can, I can agree to that. And so I, I talked with the other student and I, and I gave her the same conditions. And it was really, really amazing for me to watch them interact. It was almost like I got to just step back. And these, peop- these, these kids, these high schoolers who just 15, 20 minutes ago were um, and really had some issues with each other, now were completely different. I mean, still interacting, but in a completely appropriate way that was resolving um, the struggle that they were having together. Hmm. So, moving them towards connection and, and mutual understanding. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, sounds, it sounds like that's uh, you know that's that's the activation of empathy, sort of recognizing that whatever was so stimulating for each one of them individually, that there was through communication there was some way of understanding what the human experience of the other was and seeing that as a part of themselves. Yeah, and you know, Jared, what I find um, more times than not is when they're laying out their feelings cards, both of, both of the parties have very similar feelings. Mm-hmm. And stemming from that, both of them have very similar needs. So even though they're, they have some kind of altercation with each other, um, it's, it's eye-opening to, uh, to each of them to be able to see, oh my gosh, that person's feeling the same thing I am. Like They're frustrated just like I am. And, um, and they have a need for safety just like I do. And that really, um, it, it really kind of, uh, um, it's like a light bulb for them. Because, they're, because I, I notice the middle schoolers and high schoolers are so egocentric. They're so focused on themselves in, their, you know, in, in the world here. And, uh, and, and this helps them to be able to focus on somebody else, take them out of themselves for a moment to say, oh, yeah, um, you have feelings too. You know, this mm-hmm. and it's, so, so you're right. It really helps them to be able to, to have empathy for the other person. I, I, something you said uh, uh, brings up a question for me. Tell me a little bit about, about um, the coupling of the feeling and the need and how that relates to, to empathy. Um, you know, oftentimes, empathy is defined as you know, imagining yourself in someone else's shoes. And, and clearly, a lot of schools you know, prioritize um, in their social emotional learning curriculums feelings. But the no fault zone game adds this other element of needs of connecting our feelings to our needs and i'm curious what's your experience uh, amongst your the population at your school of making that bridge and how that fosters a more of an empathic presence or an empathic relationship between the participants in a game yeah well i i think we've i think our kids and our and our staff has learned a lot that our feelings um our feelings are generated from a need that we have so especially if we have unmet needs, our feelings are right on the surface there, and and we tend to have those tend to be the um, the outspoken parts of us, right? And then if we were to if we were to look into okay, why did I act that way? Why did I react or why did I respond that way? Um, and we were to look deep into that, we can notice that there are there are needs that we have, um, whether it's for or all sorts safety. Um, whether it's for fun and play, because I've had kids in my classes that um, they they act out, and and then you ask them about it. And working through this, they they say, "Well, I just, Mr. Gastinger, I just needed some fun. I needed some play, mm. <laughs> you know." And mm. I mean, and I it's, haven't it strikes me as so profound to be even able to have language to name that. Oftentimes, absolutely, you know, you know that that in a culture, particularly at schools, you know, kids behave in ways that, that are labeled acting out, and there's, there's just the sort of judgment of that. But what I'm hearing you say is that they're even able to name that they chose that behavior because it was contributing to some quality of fun, and who couldn't relate to, 
to wanting to have some fun from time to time. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think um, it would be easy to, to, to think that the students are just all going around saying, well, I need some play, I need some fun, <laughs> you know, I mean, all the time and not get to the learning. But that's not the case. They're really engaged in the conversation and speaking up for themselves. Mm. Um, there are a lot of students that don't, I would say, I would say um, there are a lot of people that don't know how to speak up for themselves, that don't know how to properly say, hey, hey this, is, this is what's really going on for me. Um, it's just we have a we, we we've got we have somewhat of a hardened society that it's it's hard to be able to say hey this is what I'm really feeling this is what I really need because some somehow that's seen as weak you know or um, uh, I, I don't know you have to put on a front in in front of other people and yet I see um, I see a lot of benefit and I see students that. Um, that are are building healthy lives, being able to say, "Hey, this is what I'm feeling," because th this is the need that was attached to that, and the and the cards themselves give them the vocabulary to be able to say something other than, oh, "I'm just so, you know, not know how to get it out." This way, they have something yeah. to be able to get out that. You know, I'm struck hearing, hearing you speak how you know the challenge of it, and it sounds like the the no fault zone game, the the mechanism. It's a little bit of what Victoria was saying before of having the cards, having the board, having the tactiles, having the tools sort of available for you, creates um, a lot more ease in expressing sort of this this human truth of what we're feeling and and how that feeling is related to a need, and that a culture that sort of embraces this tool increases the activates the empathy in that community because of the, the the ease that this tool provides for connecting with one another on that level yes yeah yeah you have something you can refer back to mm. when you don't know how to just have it come out you're not you haven't built built it yet inside of you and so you have something to refer back to and then as um uh, as sophie was saying uh, then you start to have the children on the playground who are saying things like Oh, maybe I need to really think about the other person, you know, instead of always just focusing on ourselves. It's it's really amazing. Hmm. Well, this is really really sweet to hear. I mean, it just sounds it sounds like a such a, a valuable tool. I mean, we keep using that word, but a tool for fostering you know this innate quality of empathy and giving it more language and giving and increasing awareness in a, in a school community for people outside of yourself. Sort of this balance between autonomy and, and um, interdependence in a, in a community. Um, I, I'm curious just to, to switch uh, just a little bit because I think another aspect of school is academics and clearly empathy plays a role in academics and I'm wondering if Sura or Victoria you want to talk at all, I, mean, I heard Sophie mention a little bit about it before, but about some of the, the curricular ways the no fault zone can be woven into into the academic uh, aspect of school. Before we do school, that, Jared, that can I also... just uh, make an observation? Um... Yeah, okay, thanks. Sure, go uh, ahead. I'm coming at the uh, game. I haven't played the game or uh, been involved in it, so I'm kind of coming from it uh, from the outside. But from my exploration of kind of the nature of empathy, an important part of em empathy is that we are aware of what's going on inside of ourselves, that we're aware of the feelings of the... Uh, the, just all, all the qualities uh, that are going on inside of our body, sort of a sensory awareness, and to be able to kind of articulate uh, those uh, qualities, uh, the values, the needs, the desires, seems to facilitate uh, the uh, empathy. And it seems to me that that's, uh, from what I'm seeing in this game, it's, it's creating a tool to uh, articulate what's going on inside of ourselves, just like creating uh, a vocabulary for that. So. I just wanted to kind of add that, since I'm a member of the panel here. <laughs> yeah. Well, can, thanks can, for I, uh, can I just add something to this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, yes, actually, Edwin, it, it's really uh, important uh, to develop self-empathy. And what the game does is, when you are talking before, Jared, of connecting feelings and needs, needs, because they're universal values, we really get off of conflicts and we go down into some common ground. So when we try to resolve issues at the level of needs, feelings and needs, we are in empathy. 
right there. Because we cannot just say, my need is more important than yours, and you don't need love or anything, and I only need love here. We Everybody needs love. And everybody needs understanding, friendship. And another thing I want to add, so right there we are in empathy, both with self and others. And the self bit is really important in our society right now. Not in the selfish way, but in the self-full way, as Marshall says. Mm -hmm. Recognizing what is really important for me. Um, safety. I just want to... Just talk about safety. We, we hear a lot about bullying. I don't know if it must be the same in the States. It's, it's a big issue here in Canada. When you can recognize that I'm feeling scared because I need safety. And we have kids who do, you know, play the game. And these are the cards we see as a teacher or when I'm in a group. When I see safety and the kids know because we work on that. When safety comes up, you know, I'm not feeling safe. I need help right now. So this is the kind of very powerful self-empathy that is also very protective. And the t children are taught, you know, if, you're, say, if, if the need that comes out is safety, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to get help? Who are you going to ask? So we work with that. And, and this is a, a okay, very... I'd love, I'd love to hear an example. I mean, what, what, what happens at, a, at your school when a child's uh, cards reveal that they're feeling scared? and they're wanting safety. How do, how do other students respond and react to seeing safety as a need be needed? How do, how do teachers respond? What is sort of the, the community response? Well, because in, in the NoFault classroom, we, we talk a lot about the group agreements and safety, you know, both physical and emotional. The children know right from the start that safety is, a, is something that, is a, <laughs> that everybody should have at school. We cannot negotiate on safety issues, both physical and emotional. If somebody starts a rumor about me, I'm not, this is not meeting my emotional safety, the need for emotional safety. If I'm being pushed in a staircase, the need for physical safety is not being met. So the children know. And, and when we see cards coming out like this on a mat, well, the teacher's red lights go up right away in mine too. And then we, we're going to go and see what's going on and address the situation right there rather than wait for the child to, to maybe not say anything for many weeks and months and then something becomes very big. Mm -hmm. So self-empathy here is the first, uh, it's, it's proactive in conflict resolution. Okay, and the children know because I meet my own need, I'm going to have to do something about this. Even though I'm feeling so scared, I'm feeling horrible, I'm feeling this big, I'm feeling embarrassed, ashamed. My need for safety is not being met and this is important. I do something about it. So this is a super important kind of self-empathy. And, and then after that, uh, so, we... I, just want to, I want to make sure I'm, I'm getting it accurate. I mean, it sounds like to me what you're saying, that, um, that this piece of self-empathy, this first capacity to even recognize that there is something happening inside of you of value that you want to be addressed, is sort of the first step for a community that wants to um, increase its, uh, and activate the empathy in that community. The first step is people, individuals knowing what's going on inside of them and having language to be able to express it. Well, exactly, because I'm also the model of myself. If I don't understand what's going on inside of me, it's going to be very hard to understand what's going on inside of others. Mm -hmm. So self-empathy is, for me, it's step number one. And, and we see it in, in, in the very young children. They're, they're very good at understanding their feelings and needs. They understand other feelings and needs in their friends, but then it's in a conflict situation, it's, it's a bit tougher. As we grow up, we mature and it gets hopefully easier. Mm -hmm. But yes, self-empathy for me is step number one. And the game achieves that. And this is very rare in Western society right now. <laughs> we don't really have tools to develop self-empathy, self-compassion in this way. Well, one of the things that you, that you, that you brought up, and, and I'm curious actually to hear from everyone on the panel about this, is I heard in the development of this game there was a real vision of creating a tool to support the integration and the, the learning of, of these skills and of this self-awareness. But also self-awareness, um, I mean, that's sort of a, a lifetime pursuit, right? Aren't we, always, aren't we always learning more about ourselves and wanting to, to understand what's happening inside of us and curious about what's happening inside of others? And so I, I, it seems very clear that this is a game designed to facilitate that dialogue and sort of begin people on that journey of self-discovery and connection with others. And I forget who had said this earlier, but that is em empathy in, on some level. But what's it like, 
I'm curious what the development is like. You, you work with children who are very young. Tom, you're working with, with older children. You know, how, how is the integration of this tool of the no-fault zone game um, seeing results in the classroom over the course of time beyond just students resolving conflicts on the playground? Do you see other tangibles that, that let us know that we're increasing the, the empathy in a school community? Um, can I answer that for <laughs> I have a very good example. Um, again, a fourth grade teacher who had the programs that whom I started a program with three years ago was telling me just last week, he said, you know what, he says, I'm in charge of the chess team this year and, and the class and, and so the kids come at, during recess and we can just play chess, I'm, I'm teaching them and he said, when I saw my three boys from three years ago come in and I thought, oh, you know, these were the boys that were labeled as being difficult, tough, that we had issues with bullying with them. And he said, when I saw them walking through the door, I thought, oh, I'm going to have to manage this situation. And he said, no, they sat down, started playing. He says, I can see they're the same individuals, but they're very respectful of each other and mm -hmm. they can talk and negotiate and sort things out together. And he said, I was so impressed. And that's saying a lot, too, particularly, I, I know personally, chess can really bring out the most sort of competitive <laughs> part of all of us. <laughs> so I, I think this was a brilliant example of, you know, if we look back three years ago, we had a really tough situation with three boys. And three years later, I know everybody's grown and we matured, but at the same time, we... Tom was saying something really nice with, with the situation with these two girls. Imagine... We've not been taught to resolve our conflicts with empathy. Now, these two girls are learning a new way. They sit down, they have their mat, and then we have a positive issue. We have mm -hmm. another conflict, and we can resolve it again positively, not all the time. But these children now are growing up with ways of seeing conflict not as a negative thing, but something that can bring out positive things. Yeah, and yeah. I really I appreciate hearing you say that. I really have this sense that if, if we show people that force and power will work to meet their needs, they'll try force and power. And if you have the experience of empathy and, and self-expression and connection really resolving a conflict favorably, you're more likely to try that as well. Exactly. So it builds on positive, uh, well, successful uh, experience too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, which, which is just amazing. Mm. Tom, do you want, to, you want to share something about what's happening at the Landmark School? Absolutely. Uh, uh, you were asking, Jared, about um, how, what are other ways that we see this affecting um, the the classroom and the school? Yeah, and, and I'd and say, the school theater, yeah, yeah. And I'd say um, I've got two things here. One is in the classrooms. Um, you can see in in our classrooms up on. Uh, many of the walls there will be this poster that says um, when you dot 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 I feel or when I I feel um, and I need so we what what that is it's a reminder to the students that they can talk to each other in a way of um, expressing feelings and needs to get back to learning because if there isn't safety in the classroom if, if students aren't feeling safe learning's really hard to take place if at all take Taking place. I mean, I mean, you can think the basic one is, is physical safety. If it's not physical safety, I mean, people are going to freeze, people are going to leave, any of that. Um, and yet, there also needs to be an emotional safety. And so, to build emotional safety in the cl classroom, we don't, you don't always have um, the game. Maybe um, if it's on a whole classroom level, or if it's just students talking to each other um, in groups, they're able. To, they have these reminders around them to say hey, you know what, I'm really feeling this when I see whatever the action is, mm. and, um, and I have a need for, and then they can, they can lay out their need, and they can get back to whatever learning is taking place at the time, whatever the concept is. Um, I think it's really important that in our classes, we're teaching our students to be able to speak to each other like that, because the, the second thing that comes up is confrontation. You had asked me earlier, Jared, how do you how do you use this type of um, tool with staff members and administration? It's it's, just, it's basically it's the same thing as what you would do in a classroom. Um, mm. When there's confrontation or conflict, how do you resolve that? Because it, it's not it's not any easier for an adult to go into conflict, you know, than it is for a, a younger a younger person. 
And so, and many adults, they would rather not have a conflict, just kind of ignore what's going on and move on with the rest of their day. And yet inside them, this, this frustration, this, um, is really building up. And so, um, and so you, they can, our staff is really understanding how to, how to express their feelings to each other and express the needs because it's a, I mean, we're, we're still talking about a business. We're still, still talking about a place that needs results. And so we have to hold each other accountable for results. And one way to do that is to talk in this manner that says, hey, this, this is kind of what I'm feeling. This is what I need because we have a commitment to get here with our students to get, you know what I mean? And we can yeah, well, really you bring pull- up you bring up a, a, the you know the subject of modeling too. I, I love what you what you just said that it's no easier for adults to navigate conflict than it is for children. There's something uh, really sweet and sort of uh, honest for, to me uh, hearing you say that. And the the challenge that uh, it sounds like what you're describing is the challenge of the adults and the administrators at a and the teachers at a school navigating conflict in this way. If they can use these same tools, um, they also are modeling that these tools are effective and, and capable of creating more empathy and more connection in a school system as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, you know, what's the reception like? How, how, how have, have you had personally had a, an experience where the No Fault Zone game was instrumental in helping you navigate a challenge with one of your colleagues? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's almost the due diligence before, before you go into the conversation. Because I know if there's, a, if there's a tough conversation coming up, I'm going to prepare for it. I'll probably put two, time, two, three times the amount of time into preparing than it, than it does actually going into the conversation and having it. Mm-hmm. And part of the way I prepare is, um, is reflecting on those things. Okay, so what am I feeling? Is that something that, I, um, th- that I'm going to bring up at the time? What are the needs that we need to get to here? And so, um, it's uh, it, you know, it's it, it really helps me to be able to walk into something feeling prepared to be able to address whatever the concern is at the time, and then and yet not only offer here are my thoughts, but be able to to receive from the other person as well. Uh, yeah, well, because- that, that really sounds similar to what what Sophie was saying before. That if you don't know, if you can't name what is alive in you, what you're feeling and needing, it makes it much harder for you to be able to listen compassionately and with a sort of, uh, I mean, with an empathic presence to what might be alive for somebody else. So it sounds yeah. like this time of self-preparation for you is, is crucial towards being able to show up in a, in a difficult conversation, um, fully honoring yourself, but also receptive to what might be the other person's experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah wow, that is a full time game. Um, I, I want to switch gears just a little bit. And Edwin, how are we on time? Another Fifteen minutes is okay. Well, I would be really remiss if we don't spend some time. I, I want to hear back from from you, Sarah and Victoria, about um, the No Fault Zone games use um, in academics. You know, Sophie has uh, mentioned something earlier that was so tantalizing to me that I just want to draw out more that that um, she experienced the game used with curriculum, imagining you were characters in a, in a book and guessing feelings and needs. And I'm just curious if, um, if that was part of the design of the game and what are some of your visions of how the, the game could be used in that capacity as well? Sir, are you, are you willing to go first? Sure. It was uh, very much a part of the design of the game as well as wanting a, a quick access and the visual kinesthetic tools we know from the inside um, that teachers are very busy, especially these days, addressing academic curriculum and standards. And we really wanted to bring this, um, this deepening understanding of human motivation with these needs into the um, study of characters and literature and history, like Sophie was saying. You know, if we could really understand uh, the motivation of, of um, people in history, uh, we can take it to the game mat and sort out conflicts uh, that could really work for people better than uh, oftentimes how these conflicts sort out. So um, we, we built into our No Fault Classroom curriculum academic uh, tie-ins throughout so that teachers would be applying the same, um, you know, and supporting these same skills and empathy in their academic subjects, actually strengthening the subjects and having empathy happening throughout the day. 
And mm -hmm. um, I'd say for middle school and high school, oftentimes when I uh, uh, consult with teachers at that level, I suggest that that's how they introduce the game and they introduce feelings and needs is, you know, not with the personal that is uh, with adolescents, like you were saying, Tom, is so intense and kind of confusing, but actually to do a step removed and look at characters in, um, in literature and history. I, I worked myself with a, a group of middle school, uh, a middle school in Portland, and they were studying Greek myths. So the teacher, their teacher uh, read the myth um, and it had uh, Zeus and, um, and uh, Prometheus featured in this situation. So I divided, the kids divided up into pairs. They each had a mat in their card decks. One was Zeus, one was Prometheus. So throughout the room there were like 10, uh, 12, 15 pairs of Zeus and Prometheus and they worked through their cards to see what the real needs were of those characters. And then um, I just went around and asked what all the feelings were of Zeus, and they all shouted out and um, then asked for what needs they'd come up with. And um, so the kids were like, oh, I got that too, or, you know, <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought about that. So just to see them engaged, and then we did the same with Prometheus. So uh, to see them engaged with that level of um, inquiry into the deeper motivating needs of these characters was pretty cool and I could see how that was just going to transfer even without addressing it personally that it would start to transfer to uh, their motivation when things came up. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So, um, yeah, that's a real exciting part of this for, for us. Yeah, really seeing seeing yourself and others in in characters and in, in characters in history and in, and in, you know, somehow humanizing important historical figures and imagining the sort of internal drama or tension that might have been alive in them that um, resulted in them making either celebratory or tragic choices as we as we look at, at the past and think about how we'd want to steer yeah. the future. And really getting to creative problem solving and conflict resolving too. So I mean you could take a group of kids um, and one could uh, represent Israel and the other Palestine and sure. sort through and get to those needs where they connect and they can really see each other as human and the kids at that level can be you know really powerful um, problem solvers around really important issues in the world because these are our leaders um, for the world as we're, we move forward and so they can come up with I mean you know the challenge is how many strat how many solutions can you come up with that could be more satisfying than what's happening today. Sure, oh, I see it. I see it. I, the, the the hearing you say that the the connection between the questions and the inquiry that the game invites and an expansion of empathy as far as seeing people on both sides of a conflict as human trying to come up with a, strat a mutually satisfying strategy um, is really really apparent. That's really really sweet. Is there a piece that you'd like to add, Victoria? Yes, I I would. Um... What we did at Landmark, because we were involved very much in the curriculum as well as this uh, nonviolent communication or PBS, positive behavior support, whatever you want to call it, piece. Um, from the very earliest ages for reading comprehension, where you know we get the standard, what is it? Um, characters, plot. Uh, who, what, when, where, mm -hmm. right? We added, even at the kindergarten level for processing, kindergarten, first grade level, the feelings and the needs of the characters. Mm -hmm. So we're bringing that in at the, the very youngest levels and their, their little readers that they've got, the, um, three, four, five page readers, very simple phonetic readers. We're always asking, so what is this character feeling and what do you think he needs in the situation? So we're starting at very, very young, expanding beyond who, what, when, where to motivation in terms mm -hmm. of feelings and needs. So that, that to me was a very special piece. We designed special um, uh, summary papers for them to, the teacher could fill it in based on what the students were saying, 
or when the students are writing more than they fill it in themselves. But So this consciousness is right there. And one of the things we're finding is that students in these even early ages, their writing is improving because they're going to be, they're going more in depth with their characters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. into motivation. So it's been really fun to see these academic applications that are solidly in alignment with meeting standards. You know, the, 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 where I sort of imagine this going, and I'd love to hear from Tom and Sophie on this, is how uh, something Sophie says really stuck with me about uh, emotional safety and mm -hmm. how when one feels scared, um, their capacity to learn and to integrate the information they're absorbing is, is a lot lessened or, or is limited in, in the breadth of, of how it could be absorbed because they're dealing with some sort of an acute fear. And so, you know, I'm imagining, as you were talking, Victoria, that, that um, you know, children as young as three and four who are finding language for these characters for, that, that imply motivation and speak to needs, you know, I can imagine that that child when they're 14 or 15 and is really challenged, say, in a math class where there isn't this humanities component where they're thinking about motivation of characters, but rather they're just sort of overwhelmed <laughs> with the challenge of learning something that's difficult for them. They would have access to a lot more self-mastery, self-awareness language that would move through maybe the fear of answering incorrectly in class and being embarrassed. <laughs> But rather, there would be a culture in that classroom that would be more supportive of learning styles and create more emotional safety that would then help that child overcome learning challenges and, and integrate. And I'm curious, Sophie or Tom, if that's been something that you've noticed in, in your schools. Okay. Go ahead, Sophie. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll let Tom go first, but I, I want to add something after. Okay. okay, I'll track that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sophie had uh, mentioned earlier something about a group agreement and the group agreement basically is uh, is the classroom sitting down together at the beginning of the semester or the um, or the school year and saying collectively hey these are the things that we need together to be able to have a successful classroom and um, and it's referred to a, a lot stems from really this feeling feelings and, and needs language um, and, it, and it allows the opportunity for a student let's say in a high school math class let's say algebra class which is um, which is tough for a lot of the students for them to be able to say to the teacher um, I, I'm really having difficulty uh, I'm feeling and, and bring up whatever those feelings are because then, then they would have the language to be able to say that as opposed to not having the language and not having a culture that we're creating in our in our school and in our individual classrooms that allows that freedom to be able to say mm -hmm. that so they they don't have to be just stuck at the you know they sit in the farthest seat from the teacher you know and they kind of are are hunkered down and they're just please don't call on me please don't call on me they don't have to feel that way they can go up to the teacher and feel open feel open just being able to say um, I'm really stuck on this concept. This class is really hard for me, and I'm feeling shut down because of that. Mm. Can we work through it? Can you help me work through it, uh, Tom? It's, that, it's so it's it's so like delightful to hear me is to hear for me to hear you add this piece because you know, Edwin is really excited about what would a culture of empathy look like, and I'm just loving the thread here of how a culture that introduces the no fault game, the no fault zone game so early as, as Victoria was saying to three, four and five year olds and lets this influence its culture, what you just described to me seems to me to be what a culture of empathy would look like. Someone who is wanting to learn, feeling comfortable expressing their feelings and needs and having that addressed in such a way that they can then get back to the task of doing what this classroom is designed to do, which is to help young people learn the subject matter. So <laughs> it's really, really exciting to me to, to sort of see those three steps sort of line up so, so nicely and, and address the central theme that, that Edwin's project has been exploring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing I've, I've um, said, I don't know, several times um, and, uh, recently is that we put our time somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, um, and what I mean by that is as a, in the classroom, sometimes the teachers feel so bogged down with all of the standards that they have to they have to complete throughout the year, and um, 
And so, and so a, an easy response would be, you know what, I don't really have time to touch base with this student on their feelings because I have, have X, Y, and Z to complete for my standards. And, and so I can check those off the list and move on to the next ones. And, um, and yet if you have a student that's, that's feeling that way and doesn't have the opportunity or the outlet to be able to say, hey, this is where I'm at, then, then their time really is wasted and your teaching time and their learning time really has not taken place. Mm. And, um, and, and so, and so it's, it's good for us to always think of where, if we're going to spend the time, how do we spend it most effectively? And, um, and to get that student on, on board with you, understanding that um, there's, there's give and take and you're going to work with them, then you have them. You can go into something even harder, another, a harder concept, and they're going to be right there with you. Even though it might still be a struggle for them, they know that you care about them. Mm-hmm. And they're willing to go ahead and push forward um, because you've taken the time initially with them. So we put our time somewhere. Mm-hmm. We want to make it most effective. You know, I, 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 love, I love that you named that. It speaks so, so eloquently to, to my experience as a student, which was I really always learned what I wanted to learn. Like my learning objectives are what informed my learning. And certainly there were times when if I, I'm imagining I'd been received more empathically and given more language about what I was struggling with, I would have been able to articulate more clearly what I was wanting to learn and maybe even gotten back on the same page as the whatever it was my teacher was passionate about offering. So... It's profound to me how how connecting on this level actually can create um, the uh, easy step, an easy course into a uh, quality of connection between me and my my teacher or, or people in my school community that's more mutually beneficial. Yeah, yeah, more learning taking place for sure. Sophie, I, I'm I'm tracking that you had something you wanted to share. I didn't want to lose that. You, is it still alive? Uh, very briefly, because I, I don't I think we're almost running out of time, but uh, just. What's coming up for me is that in our school, a culture of empathy looks like a culture where we keep our giraffe ears on. Could you, you know, say a little bit more about what, it's the third time. I'm regretting getting this to the end of the day, but we've talked about giraffe a couple times, and it's possible some of our viewers don't know exactly what that means. So, so what would it mean keep your giraffe ears on? It's, a, it's an image we use in nonviolent communication. Giraffe is a language of feelings and needs, so it is a compassionate, empathic language. Empathetic, do you say in English? Sorry, I mean, this is my French coming out. Yeah, they both in English too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, so in our school, we definitely know how to, and we try hard to keep our giraffe ears on. It doesn't mean we don't have conflicts anymore, but it means that when we have conflicts, we also have courage to address them and go through them and walk through them with the proper tools and tools that work. And and uh, for Edwin, I mean, this is what the culture of empathy looks like right now in our school. And so much so that the headmistress told me, and I still in. I have a hard time believing her, but she says that violence has gone down by two thirds in the last three years, and that when now she sees kids coming up to her office with uh, serious issues, they're so clear about what their feelings and needs are, and it's much better to you know they they can address it so much better, and and also she doesn't see retribution which we had before you know, conflict gets resolved. Mm-hmm. And poof, a week later, the opposite happens. I don't know, Tom, if that rings a bell. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, is that is that because I mean, when you say giraffe ears, that's that's listening to someone, imagining that they have feelings and needs too. Is that is that? Am I getting that accurately? Yeah, both ways, because this is what we do with the no fault zone game. You know, I listen to myself. Mm-hmm. Giraffe ears. I listen to my feelings and needs, and then I listen to your feelings and needs. Mm-hmm. And now, I I can listen with empathy. You know. And you're, and you're saying that at, at this school, there's kind of a direct correlation between one's capacity to really hear their own feelings and needs and hear the feelings and needs of another and oh, a decline in, in retribution. Absolutely. So this is direct uh, culture of empathy at work here. You know, mm. conflicts going down. And just to add something we haven't spoken about, and then we could do another whole panel on this, but on the <laughs> game. I'd love to. <laughs> on the no fault zone game, there is a thermometer at the bottom, and oh, this glad is, brought that it, up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I want to mention it because this is what I love best. <laughs> the, the thermometer. Yeah, there you go. I think you can sit on here at the bottom. 
so and and this is also a first step in in self empathy you know and especially with very small kids we use a thermometer a lot because if you're in the hot the red spot very hot your emotion is really full of energy and you might have to go back to the calm alert zone where your brain can fully function memorize listen to the teacher and where you can make better choices Okay, if I'm in the very cold, which is, a, they, these are all human yeah. emotions that are good and normal, but we cannot stay stuck in them. If I'm in the very cold, my brain does not function well during I'll, I'll school I'll just have day. to mention, we're going to so have we to bring the uh, panel to a, a close. I do feel that <laughs> we can do uh, future <laughs> panels, because I think this is such a wonderful uh, topic. And I'm open for hosting another one and uh, doing individual yeah. interviews. So um, we, are, we do need to kind of, mm -hmm. Uh, bring it to an end. So, Jared, if there's anything you'd like to do to kind of round it out, and I mean, other uh, mo most, you know, I, I just want to express a huge amount of gratitude. It's been it's been informative and um, inspiring and really connecting, uh, particularly hearing from you, Sophie and Tom, and getting a sense of how how this tool is used in in a school. Um, I've played with the No Fault Zone game before, and. Uh, it's just really inspiring to imagine that it's out there in the world in an actual school institution and having the impact and having the effects that the two of you have described today. Um, it's a marriage of both a vision I have of the world and that vision actually in action. So I want to express a lot of gratitude to both of you for coming and sharing your stories. And Victoria and Sarah, Sarah I, I need to share a similar gratitude to the two of you for inventing this game and bringing this tool into the world and having this, uh, this mechanism that does, it sounds like a lot of things you were hoping for it to do, which is to introduce some ease for teachers to, to bring these kind of uh, linguistics and this sort of empathy into the classroom. Thank Indeed. you, everyone. Very rich for me. Thank you all, uh, Edwin and uh, Jared and uh, Tom and Sophie. Your stories are just so heartwarming. It's, I'm just feeling kind of uh, very cheerful and grateful. Yes, thank you so much. This is a harmonic convergence and, for sure. <laughs> much and thank you, Jared, for being so, doing such an empathic uh, facilitation as well. So very grateful for your <laughs> wonderful uh, reflective listening and uh, moderating. Similarly, Edwin, uh, um, uh, this is just a fabulous project that you're, you're embarking upon, and, and I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunities for bringing all these people doing this work around empathy that you've coalesced and recorded and documented. It's a, it's a real treasure for the human race, as far as I can tell. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.